Hello, everybody, and welcome. Happy Sunday to you. Today is Sunday, June 13th, 2021. And this is just going to be a very quick live stream on a story that I saw last night. And I wanted to bring it to you guys because it kind of drives home one of the points that I've been trying to make on this channel for a very long time. So welcome to everybody as you fill into the room and we will get started here in just a second. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We shouldn't be here too long. Well, every time I say that it ends up being like an hour and a half, but I don't plan on us being here very long. This will be a very short stream. So welcome. Let me get this little banner off of here. And then let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. Okay, so as you feel into the room, I'll just kind of give a little bit of background on what we're getting ready to talk about. First and foremost, before we start, I wanna make sure that I'm showing empathy in regard to the situation. People very easily misunderstand me and I'm really not sure what that's about because I feel like I speak clearly. I feel like I articulate my thoughts in a clear way and people still always seem to walk away with a different understanding. So I wanna make sure on the front end of this that I'm showing some empathy in saying that I understand that COVID has wrecked many small businesses, shut some of them down forever, and I understand that COVID has wrecked the individual lives, the individual economies of many, many people all across the country and world. So I wanna make sure that I'm empathetic in that regard. I'm not blaming you. The purpose of this live stream is to show the business owners who don't completely understand why they can't get people to come work for them, to show them why. Currently, there's a false narrative circulating. And hi, everybody in the chat. Welcome. There's a false narrative circulating, and it's getting doubled down and tripled down on. And it's really tragic how people just pick it up and believe it. It's like they are so willing to believe lies and so willing to not hear the rest of the story. And what that does is make a person ignorant. That is the epitome of ignorance. You, you hear something, you like it, you scoop it up and you refuse to investigate further. So this is the investigating further, the purpose of why people aren't going to work for certain people. And it's also the purpose of the stream also is to help perhaps business owners learn to think more critically. For the life of me, I will never understand how these people are able to own and operate businesses without being able to think critically. It makes me ask the question, PTE, what are you doing wrong? Because you think critically and you still haven't propped up a business. These people don't think critically and they prop them up left and right all over the place. What am I doing wrong or what are they doing right? Do I need to turn off my critical thinking skills in order to become a business owner? Not sure, but we're going to find out. So let's explore this article. It's very, very short. And then we are going to talk through some talking points that I want to cover regarding this. Hi, everybody in the chat. Hi, Oregon. Welcome. So the article was published on June 9th. I saw it last night when I was doing my little news scroll. It says small businesses in Kansas City Metro report record hiring crunch. According to a survey, 48% of small business owners say positions went unfilled in May. It says the need for workers across the country is at a record level, according to a new nationwide survey of small business owners. Nearly half of small business owners say positions went unfilled in the month of May. That's evident at the Village Flower Company in Prairie Village. Three positions are currently vacant. Quote, I have never had this hard of a time hiring people, shop manager Cindy Heckman said, end quote. Heckman said several people have filled out applications, but then do not show up for interviews. Quote, so when you can stay at home and act like you're on vacation, getting paid without having to go to work and your money's still coming in, she said, where's the incentive to go to work? End quote. 
Pay attention to that quote. We're coming back to that, okay? She agrees with the National Federation of Independent Business, small business organizations calling for the end of federal pandemic unemployment benefits in Kansas. Governor Laura Kelly remained firm in keeping the benefits going, while Missouri Governor Mike Parson approved cutting them off. Kelly has said she is exploring the issue more. The NFIB's most recent survey of small business owners says 48% of small business owners in May reported unfilled job openings. That's 26 points higher than the 48-year average of this poll that we've been doing, said Dan Murray, NFIB Kansas director. Murray said contributing factors like child care and fear of returning to the workforce could also lead to several job openings. Keep that in mind as well, okay? He said ending federal pandemic unemployment benefits is a sure step to help. Clearly, there are jobs out there, he said. I know some people are having difficulties finding the right job, but we know there are jobs. There's a pent-up demand to get folks back in the workforce, end quote. That's evident at the Village Flower Shop. Quote, there are still needs and there's still demands, Heckman said. Okay. And that is the whole article. And we're actually, let's watch this little brief video clip, okay? Because I want to I want to give you a feel for who's saying this, okay? We try to always do something unique. At the village flower shop, the process to hire more help has recently been nowhere near as pretty as the flowers they offer. We have been trying to hire for a long time. Manager Sandy Hackman says she has three open positions, and when she gets people to apply... They sound really good, they look good on paper, they don't show up. A recent National Federation of Independent Business survey showed 48% of small business owners in May reported unfilled job openings. It's the fourth consecutive month of record high readings. That's 26 points higher uh, than the 48-year average of this poll that we've been doing. NFIB Kansas Director Dan Murray is calling for an end to federal unemployment benefits in Kansas. Clearly there are jobs out there. Uh, and I know some people are having difficult times finding the right job, but we know there are jobs. There's a pent up demand to get folks back into the workforce. Let's grab this one. There's still needs and there's still demands. And if you're looking for a job, this flower shop is hiring. Our customers are probably more like family to us. Okay, so if you're looking for a job, you can go work for Cindy at the Village Prairie Flower Shop. But I guarantee, I guarantee, and I noticed they left this little quote out of the video, but I guarantee that Cindy's going to have a tough time getting people to work for her. Cindy, what is your turnover rate? I'm very curious what your turnover rate was prior to the pandemic. Super curious. These are the types of questions they need to be answering. Well, our turnover rate was pretty high prior to the pandemic. So we're not really surprised that we're having trouble finding employees because we had trouble keeping employees before the pandemic. I'm just asking. So I noticed they left this quote out. So we're going to explore it since they left this clip out of the video. But this clip is really, or this quote is really what inspired this whole live stream. Because it is the essence and the root of narcissism truly, and one of narcissism's primary hallmark traits, which is presumption or being presumptuous, meaning you really truly think you know what's going on, and then you go on to make decisions based on what you think, not what you know, not what's fact, you start making decisions based on what you think. You know how they're always hollering about facts versus feelings? No one ever talks about facts versus what you just think. Because feelings are emotion-based. Thoughts are thought-based. So they're always saying, oh, F your feelings. Your feelings aren't facts. Well, neither is what you think. Just because you think it's true doesn't mean it is. But what these people tend to do is go off what they think and then they they make decisions and start talking based on that and oftentimes they're 100 percent either incorrect or incomplete so the quote says so when you can stay home 
and act like you're on vacation, getting paid without having to go to work and your money's still coming in, where's the incentive to go to work? So let's unpack this, okay? Let's unpack this because I need people to learn how to unpack statements like these because this is all I've been seeing you know, coming out of certain talking heads, certain pundits. Oh, well, of course they don't want to go to work with their unemployment. And they stop right there. That's it. That's, that's the full extent of the thought process. So let's break it down. So when you can stay at home and act like you're on vacation. So what's embedded there? There's some condescension embedded there. There's the assumption that people who are home collecting unemployment aren't doing anything. She assumes they're not applying to other jobs. She assumes they're not working like little gig jobs like Uber, Uber Eats, DoorDash. She assumes they're not interviewing because keep in mind, Cindy, just because you apply for a job doesn't mean you're gonna get it. Do you know? God, I don't know which year it was, but there was a year in recent years that I put out over a hundred job applications and I have proof of it all, proof of it all. And they're well done. I don't do sloppy job applications. And listen, I'm not saying either that just because I apply, they have to hire me. See, this is why this whole thing is so messed up because it's a two way consent thing. Just because you have a job opening doesn't mean someone has to apply to it. And just because I apply to your job opening doesn't mean you have to hire me. That's why we have record high unemployment. That's why people are becoming homeless by the day, because we're doing this weird consent dance when everyone needs money and everyone needs employees. We've got to stop with the fakery. It's stupid. There was a period of time in our history where we could do this little artificial fake dance, very similar to how sororities and fraternities recruit. Like, oh, I kind of like you and you kind of like me, but oh, I don't know if I want you and you don't know if you want me. And I, 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 We don't have time for that anymore. We're beyond that. So anyway, my point in saying all that is, so someone's home collecting unemployment. How do you know they haven't applied to six different jobs today? How do you know that? How do you know that after they get through applying to six different jobs, they then go work for four hours for Uber Eats to have some kind of money coming in? How do you know that the people who are doing all this don't have college degrees or do? There's a lot of people with college degrees sitting at home, putting in 10, 12, 13 applications per day, per day, per day. They need to do a study on that. Also, while I'm remembering it and while it's at the top of my mind, I personally think it should be illegal to consistently turn away qualified employees, meaning if they have the background, they have the experience at risk of getting to like a political discussion. We'll just say for the sake of argument, they have no criminal criminal record. You know how they do. They do. They run their background checks to see if you've been convicted, all that. That's a different discussion. We'll just say for the sake of argument, no criminal record. You know what I mean? Everything is turning up clean for the most part. You just don't want to hire them because you don't think they fit into your quote unquote culture, your company culture. That needs to be made illegal, especially in emergency times like this. If you're here, you're available, you have the background or you can be trained. You need to be hired, period, period. And who you are will show itself one way or the other. If you're a bad employee, it's going to come out one way or the other. Sometimes you're going to hire bad employees, but by and large, you're going to hire decent people who are willing to work. OK, um, I think I tweeted about this like a month or two ago, but I think the way they need to do it is if a business puts a job opening out there. They have a certain number of rejections before they start to get fined by the city or by the federal government. I don't know which one we'll, we'll sort that out later, but basically you can only reject 25 candidates for this role before you start to get fined and they need to report it too. We interviewed three people for this job today. It didn't work out for these reasons. So now you have 22 rejections left. Okay. And after, after the 25th rejection, we're going to start finding you because what you're doing is creating a burden 
because this is our system. Our system is stupid. I'm, I'm not saying that it's a great system, but our setup is currently, if a person can't find a job, then they take most, a lot of people will take unemployment if they don't have the savings to cover it. And a lot of people had the savings to cover it and wipe, wipe those savings out. So some people had three months, six months, one year's worth of living expenses saved up, which is very good. That's very good. That's what all the financial advisors say. But then when COVID hit, they probably thought, okay, this will go away quickly. I'll lean on my savings for a little bit while I look for another job. But then it rapidly became clear to many people that this could go on longer than anyone planned. So they start to take out unemployment maybe after they've wiped their savings out already. You see how much you're missing, Cindy? So anyway, I think it should be illegal to turn away people after you've re rejected a certain number of people. Yes, I think a business has a right to kind of serve as the gatekeepers to their establishment, but because of the way our system is set up, it's so parasitic, or some people prefer the term interdependent, which does have a more positive connotation, but I still keep leaning back on parasitic because you, you literally need me to survive and I literally need you to survive. That's parasitic. Interdependent implies that we don't necessarily need each other, but we choose to work together. But that's just my opinion. I'm not, I'm not saying that's gospel. I'm just saying that's my opinion. So because we've designed this parasitic relationship between us all, the one who has the most power needs to be the one that's held the most accountable. So if you're a multi-million dollar corporation who can afford to hire 1,000 people and give them health benefits, but you're just not because you don't like them as people, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with them. They're totally capable, 100% willing and able to work, but you just don't really like them. They don't fit the culture, your company culture. You need to be fined after a certain number of people are turned away. I'm so serious. But anyway, getting back to the actual topic at hand. So when you can stay at home and act like you're on vacation. So Cindy has completely just totally disregarded all the different circumstances that could be going on. She assumes that people are just sleeping in, waking up when they feel like it, drawing their unemployment, making a Mai Tai and enjoying their day. That's what you guys do, Cindy. Cindy, that's what you guys do. Here's what you guys do. You prop up these businesses. You dupe investors out of millions of dollars usually, but sometimes it's only like hundreds of thousands. You dupe investors because you're very good snake oil salesmen. And a lot of investors like to be lied to, so they kind of deserve it. But anyway, these people give you all this money. You prop up these little companies. You have no emotional or personal investment in them. You do the bare minimum that won't get you sued. And you do the bare minimum that's like one kick above being inhumane. And if you didn't have to do that legally, you wouldn't. So you hire people, you pay them minimum wage and sometimes below minimum wage and expect the customers to make up their income in the form of tips. Then Cindy, what you guys do is go and get on your boat and kick your heels up and make my ties and float around the local lake in the middle of the week while everyone else is running your business. Cindy, that's what you guys do. That's what y'all do. You're accusing us of what you do. You guys stay at home and act like you're on vacation every day. You guys hire managers to run the stores so you can go vacation in the Alps for a week. That's what you guys do. You're lazy. You are the laziest out of all of us. You are the laziest. You are. You guys hire housekeepers because you buy homes that are too big for anybody to take care of, really. Truly, if we're being honest, the homes are too big for anybody to take care of, but you buy them and then you pay other people to take care of the houses for you. Sometimes you pay those people to actually live with you. So they literally live with you in a very nice basement. Now you take care of them. The basement is nice. It's furnished. It's complete. It has a full bathroom, full bedroom internet, Wi-Fi, air conditioning, and maybe even a little kitchen. 
So your live-in servant has a very, very nice accommodation. They really do, but they definitely live with you. They definitely take care of your children for you. They definitely raise your children for you. They definitely keep your house clean for you. They definitely do your laundry for you. They definitely cook for you. So you can do what, Cindy? So you and your husband can go golf. So it sounds like the ones who are staying at home and acting like vacation are you guys. You guys are the biggest leeches, the biggest louses on the planet. You really are. You are the biggest welfare recipients, the biggest dependents on planet Earth. You really are. You're the problem. You are lazy. Remember when I told y'all a couple streams ago, I don't know which one it was, but we were talking about lunch bucket. And I said, don't do, don't act out in those ways. The most, the worst thing you could ever do to these people is make them do their own work. That is literally the worst thing you ever do to them. And I mean it. It's, it's the most cruel thing that you could ever do to them. If you really want to be a cruel person, make these people do their own work. That's the worst thing you could ever do to them because they've literally designed their lives to not have to do their own work. So I guarantee you, Cindy has had to come to the shop a couple of days and, and chip in because they can't hire anybody. <laughs> Nobody wants to work there. And who would? So that leads me to my next point. If this is the type of person who would automatically jump to these type of conclusions, what other conclusions would she jump to if you're her employee? Think about it. Hey, Cindy, I've been working here for about six months. I was wondering if I could get two days off to, you know, go to the doctor and run some errands and, you know, go to my kid's softball game. Oh, well, I mean, I worked for 10 years without a break. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to decline your request for a time off because, I mean, you guys just don't know what hard work is anymore. Well, Cindy, um, I, I, I've worked for six months straight with no break and even some holidays. I was just hoping for two days. I really need to run to the dentist and I just want to go get a checkup at the doctor. And my kid has a softball game on Friday and I just want to be there for him to like cheer him on. That's it. You know, I, I don't have any other time off requests coming. Well, did you know that when I was a young mom and a young wife and I had a new baby, sometimes that I had to work like for 10 years straight and I didn't have any time off when my baby was growing up. So no, I'm sorry. I'm going to decline your time off request. And it's like, okay, well, do you foresee any time in the future where I could get some time off? Well, like I said, I worked for 10 years straight without any breaks. No one gave me any time off. So um, unless you're like dying, no. And I know that's extreme. That's just an example, but it probably isn't extreme to some of you listening. It goes like that. That's how it goes. I'm telling you, you know what I mean? Or here's another example. Hey, Cindy, um, you know that the millennials love succulents, right? You know that they've been going like nuts and going crazy over the succulents, right? Can we order a few succulents and keep them in stock? I get a phone call every day, at least once a day, asking about them. When I was coming up, we didn't have succulents. We had regular flowers, like normal people, like good Americans. I don't know what these succulents are. You kids and your technology and your succulents. What is it even? Well, it's a plant, Cindy. It's like a plant and like they're really cute and people like to put them in flower pots. And I think we could probably really turn a nice little profit. It would be a great little extra thing to sell. We got plenty of space right over there. I take care of them. Ugh, no, I, you, you kids and your newfangled plant, like every day, every day, it's something new with your talk tick and your witter twits and now succulent. No, no succulents in the shop. That's how it goes. That's how it goes. That's how these people think. So Cindy is sitting here wondering why nobody wants to work for her. But look at your attitude. Look at your mindset. You're showing the whole world who you are with this one quote. So when you can stay at home and act like you're on vacation, getting paid without having to go to work and your money's still coming in, where's the incentive to go to work? You know what else Cindy is probably resistant to? Technology. So I guarantee you she's had employees that have been like, hey, Cindy, why don't we put pictures of our flowers on Instagram? Hey, Cindy, do you think we can get some internet in here? Hey, Cindy, you know, there's all kinds of different um, software where we could 
store customer information. We could send them marketing emails. We could, um, you know, even ring them up. You know what I mean? Like, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but they, there exist all kinds of different little apps for that. And I guarantee you she's vetoed every single one of them. Doesn't want to evolve, doesn't want to change. Remember I told you I would divorce my software developer husband if he didn't change Microsoft Windows? If we were married for 10 years and I was like, honey, Windows sucks. I don't like it. I hate it. And you're like the head software developer. You could influence this. Ah, it's been selling. Ah, ah, we're still making profit. Ah, no need to change it. We're still making profit. So you know what that turns into? Hey, honey, I think we need a new roof. I think we have a leak. Ah, that roof is good for 20 years. Yeah, well, it's year 14 and I think we have a leak. Can we get it looked at? Ah, that roof is good for 20 years. I'm not spending that money. Divorce. Divorce court. I'm not living stuck. I'm not staying stagnant for you and your stagnant mind. Stagnant mind, stagnant brain, stagnant lifestyle. No growth, no change. I heard this quote on R.E. Dossett's channel. Dossett, check your email. But R.E. Dossett said, anyone who does not grow and change with time is at risk of becoming your enemy. And that stuck with me. Anyone who does not grow and is not open and amenable to change and growth with time is at risk of becoming your enemy. And I have never heard a truer statement, I don't think. It's true. So these are the type of people who she's been running that flower shop the same way for 20 years. She sees no need to change it. And that's fine. But these are, all, are also the people who get bodied when a new company comes out and does everything that you refuse to do. So when they develop the app for flowers on demand, where you basically open the app, type in, I want some roses. And within an hour or two, roses are at your front door. You're done, Cindy. So let's continue. All right. So let's explore this some more. We're still breaking down all the presumption that's built into this comment. OK, so she says that, you know, what's the incentive to go to work? So she's making some other assumptions. She's assuming that everyone who's not coming in to apply to her job has no incentive to go to work. Well, first of all, Cindy, how do you know that they didn't just find a job somewhere else? How do you know that they, they didn't apply next door? Remember she said they've had three people apply and none of them showed up for interviews. Now that is rude. I will say that you should always maintain your professionalism. So if someone calls you, extends an interview to you, you agree and accept, and then you just don't show up, like that's not the right thing to do. You don't have to take that job. You don't have to go on that interview, but the right thing to do is call or email or text or something and say, hey, thank you so much for the opportunity. I found another opportunity. Good luck to you, right? No one likes breaking up, but that is the professional way to do things. So I would highly encourage being professional in that respect. If someone offers you an interview and you decide you're not going on it, just let them know because they set aside that time for you. And that's time someone else could have had that interview and gotten that job. You see what I mean? So let's show each other respect in that way. But that said, those three people who didn't show up, even though that is very rude, how do you know they didn't just take a job somewhere else? <laughs> they applied, didn't they? So if they applied, that meant at least at some point in time, they wanted to come work possibly for you. So why are you assuming that they're just lazy people sitting around at home doing nothing with their heels kicked up like you guys do on your boat when the fact of the matter is, or the truth of the matter is, they might have just found a job somewhere else. They might have, Cindy, here's how y'all do things. Y'all like to let us apply to a job, right? Let's say in January. And then y'all like to call us back in April for the job that we applied to in January. So Cindy, how do you know that that's not the case? How do you know that they, they didn't apply to a job that they really wanted back in February, never heard anything back, so they were just putting out applications, put one in your shop. You called them back for an interview, but before they could come to your interview, they got hired for the job they applied to back in February. So if you wanna change the game, you absolutely have to talk to your fellow 
hiring managers and business owners and say, hey, guys, if people apply to your job, can you please let them know within like oh, 30 days is kind of excessive. But I mean, I'm trying to be generous here. Can you let them know within 30 days that the answer is no? So they don't they're not hanging in the ether. And so they're not getting snatched up just when I was getting ready to hire them. That would piss me off if I was a business owner. And there was some company that potential employees kept applying to, but they don't hear from them for six months. And then just as I'm about to hire them, they hear from y'all and go with y'all. I would be calling. We would be having a conversation. And I would say, hey, I have lost 12 different candidates to you guys because y'all don't know how to call people back in a timely fashion. You're starting to piss me off. How can we collaborate on this and make this to where you hire people or tell them no within 30 days? You see what I mean? So there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on that Cindy has just boiled down to, well, they're acting like they're on vacation, just drawing their unemployment money. Okay, so there's that. The other thing is, how do you know that they're home? You just assume they're home. How do you know that? You don't know where these people are. You don't know if they're home. You don't know if they're somewhere taking care of a sick parent, elderly parents. You, you don't know if they're out working in their yard. So you assume that they're home. You also are assuming that they're not being productive. So a lot of people might be unemployed right now. How do you know that they haven't re-enrolled in school? So yeah, they're unemployed. They're unemployed as shit, but they're also taking their master's level courses or their bachelor's degree or their trade or their certificate classes. So yeah, they're planning on being unemployed for the next three months, but at the end of those three months, you know, they might have a certificate that they can go use to get a job 10 times better than yours, Cindy, and paying 10 times more than yours, Cindy. You don't know. And what kills me about these people is that they just walk around like they are so damn smart and like they just have all the answers and they make all these decisions based on this fake knowledge in their heads, this artificial knowledge that is curated and honed by their favorite pundits and talking heads. They'll go on Fox News or wherever and be like, well, Americans don't want to go back to work because they're drawing all this unemployment. Then they'll bring on a so-called expert and say, well, yeah, well, you know, if you're making more money off unemployment than working, well, yeah, well, yeah, of course you wouldn't go back. But these are the capitalists who will argue that if they can make a business decision that will save the company money, it's worthwhile. So it's always worthwhile to you to make more money in one way than another. But when the average citizen goes, huh, I'm making $1,000 off unemployment. I was making 300 working, hmm, $700 profit. And you're mad that they're behaving like capitalists. You're mad that they're acting like you, like a true narcissist. True narcissists really hate it when you start to act like them. And that's why my most popular video on this channel, Fun With Your Narcissist, is nothing more than you acting like them, giving it back to them. That's it. You're just behaving just like them. And it drives them crazy. They can't stand it. They can't take it. So when the average citizen starts acting just like you, like a capitalist, you, you, you are literally in meltdown mode. And their solution is to cut off unemployment to try to force people back to work. But I'm telling you, it's not even a prediction, it's a guarantee. I'm telling you it's not going to work because I'm telling you so many people pivoted during this time frame. So many people got their money right during this time frame. So many people formulated and came up and enacted a plan B during this time frame. You guys made survivors out of us. You guys made survivors out of people who were not survivors before. You did that. You did that. You made brand new preppers out of all of us. So the damage, what you call damage is done. Cut off the unemployment benefits. It's not going to change a thing. They're still not coming back. They're not. Like you have to do a complete overhaul of who you are, how you operate, who you used to be 
The times have changed and you will discover that cutting off unemployment doesn't do anything. It does nothing. Your threats don't work anymore. We're not scared anymore. You guys literally drug us down to the bottom. You drug us to the bottom. So those of us who survived the bottom, you made long-term lifelong survivors out of us. Cut them off. Do whatever you got to do. What's your next step? What's your next move? You're going to send in the military to force us to come work at your low wage jobs. Why don't you try paying us? You could do that. You could try paying us a living wage and offering health insurance. These little piddly part-time low wage jobs. If you want some employees back, why don't you try offering health insurance and make it free? Hmm. Ooh. Hey, we don't pay very much, but we offer, offer free health insurance. You'll get some employees. I guarantee it. Why don't you try um, treating them like human beings? Why don't you try firing all of your narcissistic managers? You know the ones, the ones who have all those complaints on them at HR. Try firing them and see what happens. Word will get out. The employees that are left over who are still friends with the ones that left say, hey, can you believe they fired Cindy? Yeah. No, no, no. They fired her. No, they didn't transfer her. They fired her. She doesn't work for this company anymore. Yeah, they're hiring some new guy. I don't know, but maybe in like a month or so, apply, think about coming back. Because believe it or not, and this message is for you, narcissistic, simple-minded business owners. A lot of people actually like the job itself, believe it or not, even though you look down on it. A lot of people don't mind the actual job. They don't mind it. It's you they can't stand. It's your policies they can't stand. It's your procedures they can't stand. It's being treated like less than a human being that they cannot stand. That's what they can't stand. And that's why they're not coming back to hell with you. They're also a lot of employees are tired of taking abuse from the customers. This whole attitude of the customer is always right. That needs to die. The customer is not always right. The customer is often wrong. And when you side with these ignorant, loud mouth customers, you make your employees feel like, wow, like where is the loyalty? Sometimes the customer is indeed right, but oftentimes the customer is wrong. You all have to get comfortable with chastising people again. This whole country needs to be spanked. This is the most delicate, sensitive. Oh my God, y'all all need beatings is what you need. You need to be chastised. You need to be told when you're wrong. So you can learn. That's how people learn when you tell them that you're wrong. Ma'am, I'm sorry, you are wrong in this situation. Oh, you're going to call corporate? Call them. You see what I mean? Not just siding with wicked people and making your employee feel small. You can't do that. But anyway, a lot of people actually like the job. For example, years ago, I used to work for DSW. I loved being around all those shoes all day. Loved it. Loved it. And because I, I think I have a mild form of OCD, I had no problem like straightening them either. <laughs> I had a whole system. I had a whole plan. I had a whole approach to keeping that store clean. I loved, loved being around all those shoes. Loved it. I hated my management. Hated it. Hated how they wanted us to harass the customers. I couldn't stand it. Soon as the customer hit the door, I walk up into him and I forgot what the program was called, but it was some some rewards program. Walk up to him and hit him with, hey, are you a rewards member? Hey, you rewards member. Follow him around the store. Hey, you rewards member. Hey, I can sign you up right here. People don't want to be bothered with all that. Leave them alone. Leave people alone. Design programs that are so good, their friend told them about it. And your employee doesn't have to follow them around the store to harass them and stalk them into this scammy little program. Their friend told them about it. They came up to me. Hey, I heard about this shoe program. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Oh, can you tell me more? Sure. Tell them more. Well, can I sign up like right now? Yeah, sure. Not me hunting you and following you around the store. Like, hey, 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 did you hear about our program? Hey, I know I asked you this three aisles over, but I'm going to ask you again if you heard about our program. I'm not doing that, man. Harassment. It's pure. It's purified harassment. All right. So let's see here. What other points did I want to make? I got a few notes. Let me see. 
I think I made them all. Oh, no, I have a few more, uh, another point to make. So, and someone said this earlier in the chat and I missed it. It's already gone by. So shout out to someone who made this, uh, the same sentiment that I'm about to make, but businesses are starting to understand the voluntary nature of employment. And prior to this, like I've said before, they relied on your dependency and your desperation to keep their doors open. So they relied on the fact that you needed to pay your rent and were desperate to do so, needed to eat and were desperate to do so. And when you keep wages artificially low, it makes it to where people can only really live from paycheck to paycheck and they like it like that. Because when you're paycheck to paycheck, you are desperate. And what this unemployment money has done for some, not all, but for some, is it provided a little bit of a cushion. And that's all you ever really needed was like one month of cushion. Because if you think about it, most of you have been working nonstop since you started working. And many of you had to do that. Not all of you, but a lot of you had to work nonstop since you started working. All you ever needed was a cushion. That's it. And a lot of you got it. And that's it. It changed the game forever. This cushion will last some of you the rest of your lives. And I know you don't believe me. I would have to do a separate stream on like the long form math of all that. But I've done the long form math. This cushion, if you play your cards correctly, could last you the rest of your life. The word I'm looking for is leverage. This leverage could last you the rest of your life if you play your cards correctly. All right. Those of you who went out and blew it, you're going to be right back in the same position if these people ever get their economy back the way they want it. But those of you who saw the opportunity that was in front of you used it as leverage and it will be leverage for you for the rest of your life because all you ever needed was that one break. You needed one financial break, a 30 day financial break, and you got it. Some of you got more than 30 days worth. So you better use it wisely. So now you are in the power position. And these businesses have started to understand that all employment is voluntary. It is. The only employment that's not really voluntary, I would say, is like if you contract, like if you're building a building and you contract out a con construction company and you pay them millions of dollars, well, it's not really voluntary at that point, but they could still back out and then just face the repercussions of being sued for that money. You see what I mean? That's the only situation I can really think the employment is not voluntary, where you've already contracted out and paid for the services. But other than that, all employment is voluntary and you should treat it as such. And those employers who understand that even though I'm paying this person, them showing up every day is a voluntary act. The ones who understand that are the ones who will keep their employees long term. They are also the ones who are not having trouble getting their employees to come back because their employees reflect and they think about how good these people have treated them and they want to return the favor. They want to return that loyalty. Most people are good people. Most people like doing the right thing and most people respect and reward those who have treated them right in the past. But you all like to think that people have the memories of goldfish, which I think is an old stereotype, but I'm going to go ahead and use it, meaning, oh, they forget how bad I treated them yesterday. That's that's in the past. And that's how a lot of narcissists are. And that's how a lot of narcissists think. They think that they can treat you like trash the day before and that you will forget and treat the next day like a blank slate. And the issue with that is, Okay, let me let me back up a little bit. When something bad happens between two people and they talk about it, work it out, forgive each other and decide to put it in the past, that is one thing. But what the narcissist likes to do is treat you like trash, won't be held accountable for it, doesn't want to talk about it, never makes it right. They never atone for their actions. And then they expect you to put it behind you and move on. And then if you're in the unfortunate situation of a long-term exposure to a narcissist, what happens is all those infractions build up and they add up over time. And over time, it becomes, I would almost say impossible to forgive them. 
And the reason it almost becomes impossible to forgive them is because it becomes impossible to atone for everything that they've done. You can't make up for it. Some things just can't be made up for. That's why it's important to fix issues right away when you can, because if you let them go too long, eventually you can't make up for it. There is no apology. Now, I know that goes against a lot of religious teachings. You know, they say you're supposed to forgive and how can how can God forgive you if you can't forgive others? Y'all just have to forgive me. I'm still, you know, I'm still working on that because you can reach a point with me that is beyond forgiveness. I'm sorry. Like, that's a different show. I think I will do a show on forgiveness, actually, though. I think we need to talk about that, what it means what it really is, how it's defined, you know, by religion, my opinion on it and why I struggle with the concept. We might do a show on forgiveness. Okay. But anyway, one more thought, and then I think we'll do a real quick after show and then we'll get out of here. Okay. So here is the harsh reality of business. And it's something that I feel like Many business owners as of recent have forgotten, especially here in America, but all business ventures, while very noble, are risks. All business ventures are risks. There is no guarantee that you will have customers and there is no guarantee that you will have employees. There's not. Like if I wanted to open up a little barber shop, just as the owner, not as a, a barber or a cosmetologist, I could get the permits, I could get the building, I could get the loans, I can prop it up, I can get the LLC, get all my insurance together. You know, I can have a grand opening. And with all of that, there is no guarantee that I will have customers or employees. There's not. And I could sit on the on the curb and cry and say, but I, I meant so well, I'm trying to do good. I opened up this barbershop for my community and I can't get anyone to come work for me, and I can't get any customers either. Why, Lord, why? I put so much into this. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into this. The reality and the truth of the matter is there is no guarantee that I will have customers, and there's no guarantee that I will have employees. There's not. And that is the risk factor of opening up a business. So when you take that risk, you have to do everything in your power to make sure that your business is attractive to both employees and customers. And truly, you have to make your business attractive to the employees first. Because <laughs> without employees, who's going to serve your customers? If you open a restaurant and you do all the things, permits, land, building, insurance, all of it, all clear, you're good. You have officially opened your restaurant. If you have no cooks, no wait staff, no greeters, um, no hostesses, your customers are only going to pop in for so long before they're like, well, I can't get any food here. Then nobody works here. I saw a video online last night where a girl went to a gas station and literally nobody was there. And turns out what had happened was the employee that was on the last shift, her coverage didn't come in. And she basically called her boss and said, if my coverage doesn't show up, I'm going home. Shout out to that employee. <laughs> people like you have my heart. You don't know it, but people like you actually own my very heart. You have me in the palm of your hand. But uh, she called her boss and informed her boss that if my coverage doesn't show up, because apparently it was like a 3 a.m. shift change. And so she said, hey, if my cover doesn't get here, I'm going home. And that's exactly what she did. Now, I'm sure they fired her for that. But who cares? Good job. Because she may have had children at home. She may have had children somewhere being babysat, needing to be picked up. She might have already extended her shift. Who knows? Maybe she was supposed to get off at 8. And as a courtesy, she stayed until 3 a.m., and then when no one came to relieve her, she said, well, I'm going home. And apparently she didn't have keys to lock up. So she just left. <laughs> and this person was walking around recording going, hello, is anybody here? Hello. There was nobody there. They called the cops and the cops eventually just came and I guess just stood watch over the store. 
until somebody showed up. But you know what I mean? That's the whole point. Like, hey, you have to, you have to remember that all employees are showing up on a voluntary basis. You have to treat them right. You have to have things in place that support them. That should never happen. Like the manager of that store should have been like, okay, your coverage didn't come. Okay, well then I'll be there. That's what leaders do. Leaders pull themselves up by their bootstraps and go cover the store until the next employee can get there. I've always felt like businesses should have more employees than they need. So for example, instead of hire, instead of having four whole employees that work at your gas station, why not have like 10 or 12? And then, and they know, hey, there's not always going to be a whole lot of hours for me, but you know what that does for them? It enables them to go work somewhere else. So they can get most of their hours from this other business. And then you call them occasionally like, hey, we don't have coverage for 3 a.m. Are you available? And they're like, yeah. And they already know how to run the store. They already know how everything works. They're your employee. They're kind of like, um, oh, what do they use to call them? Not backups, not stand-ins. What do they use to call them, y'all? I can't think of the name. There's an actual term for that. Ah, uh, oh, well, it'll come to me. But that's kind of the overall point, though. You have to... You have to design your business to be attractive to your employees first and your customers will, will naturally come on call. Thank you. On call. Yeah, like substitute teachers. People would love that. I would love that, y'all. Like I have a full time job, but I would be on call for a couple of different businesses. Sure. Why not? Here's a major point I wanted to make on a previous stream. And I really regret that I didn't say it then because I felt like I accidentally contributed to the narrative that I don't like. And what I said in that stream was, I said, their fear is that if these unemployment benefits continue, no one will ever come to work for them again. And I said, yeah, that's probably true. And then I went off on another point, but what I should have said in that stream and what I'll say now is, but keep in mind, a lot of people just like money and don't mind working. I know several people who have like two or three different jobs, not because they need them, they just like money. They like it, they enjoy it. They, they like having a little bit of extra coming in, they don't mind. They may not have anything else going on or nothing else to do, so they work. They got a full-time job and two part-time jobs. They like money, they like to work. Y'all forget that about people. But a lot of people just simply refuse to be mistreated anymore. And a lot of people have come to understand that they can survive without being mistreated by you. They didn't think they could before, but what this pandemic taught them is that they can indeed survive without being mistreated by you. I saw an article, I think today, that said a lot of people are choosing to simply quit rather than return to the office. Again, you guys have my heart, you just don't know it. You don't know it, but you literally have me in the palm of your hand. You don't even know it. Thank you, Michael, for the super chat. I appreciate it. Thank you for your support and thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it so much. Y'all got my heart though. Those of you who, who have the courage to tell your boss or your employer, I am doing the same work for you at home that I would be doing in the office and I'm producing at a higher rate. I'm not coming back and your employer threatens you with firing and you say, go ahead. Like y'all don't understand how I would wash your feet. You don't get it, but it's okay. You'll get it one day. One day, uh, let me see what else. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say, and then we'll do a quick after show and then we'll go. So I already said that it's a gamble. Opening any business is a gamble and a risk. It's not a guarantee. You hope that it works, but it might not. And somewhere along the lines in this country, we got the idea that my business must succeed. So if I opened it, you have to come to it and it has to succeed because this is how I live and you wouldn't let me die, would you? And it's like, well, sweetheart, nobody told you to open that restaurant though. Nobody told you to do that. I mean, and I wanna, I wanna be clear here. 
I'm not saying no one should ever open a business. I'm not saying go for it. Not I'm not saying not to go for it. I'm not saying don't try because the truth of the matter is all the businesses that surround us, we benefit from. I benefit from my local big box retailers and I benefit from my local small businesses. I do every day. Every day I benefit from these establishments. As a society, we benefit. As a society, we have had an opportunity to see what happens when we don't have our goods and services coming to us at a regular cadence like we're used to, like it completely shut us down and it scared us, did it not? So we understand how important our businesses are. I'm not saying we don't want you and I'm not saying that we don't need you. What I'm saying is for these business owners who have taken up this position of, you better not let me die. You better not. I opened this business, you better come. You know what I mean? Like if I had the money and the time and the resources and I was already coming on camera and stuff, I would do a experiment where I walk around like a mall, for example, and everyone who asks me to buy something, I just buy it. So I just go from store to store and everything they try to push on me, I just accept it. And at the end of that video, the purpose of that video would be to show you how much money I would spend every single day if I said yes to everybody who's asking me to buy something. If I ever become a rich and wealthy woman, I'm going to do that video because I want to prove it to you. Like, hey, will you sign up for this? Yeah, it's only $99.95. Okay. Hey, you want to sign up for this credit card? You know, blah, blah, blah. Assuming that I would get approved. <laughs> We're going to assume that I would get approved for any credit card I ask for. Okay. Uh, you know, hey, do you want our store credit card? Yeah, sure. Hey, do you want that? Yeah, sure. Hey, do you want to buy it? Yeah, sure. Hey, you want this flat iron? Yeah, sure. Sure. Hey, you want this? Yeah, sure. And just literally accepting everything and, and buying everything that anyone was trying to push on me that day to show you, A, how much stuff I end up going home with and B, how much money I end up seeing, spending and C, how many credit cards end up getting opened up in my name that day. Okay. Entitlement. Yes. It's the entitlement of it all. And then when you say no, they look at you like, how could you do this to me? You are killing me. Don't you understand that I put my blood, sweat and tears into this? And you telling me no is you taking food out of my child's mouth. And my response has always been, sweetheart, I can't say yes to everybody. I just said yes to them over there. So I can't say yes to you. I can only eat one meal at a time. So if I say yes to this restaurant right now, that means I have to say no to the rest of you. That should be the other one. Wait, no. Well, rest, do restaurants really do that? They do it in the food court. They give you little samples, which are tasty and delicious. I don't know that they really push food on you like that, though. That would be different. But anyway, y'all get my point, though, right? Instead of it being your decision, instead of it being something that's so good, you hunt it down and stalk it. I know all of you in the chat have had the experience of at least one product that you have hunted down and stalked until you found it. I know you have at least one where you went store to store to store, you called around, you searched all over the internet, you hunted this product until you found it. That's how all products should be. When I, when I walk into the store, here's, here's my vision for all stores, because keep in mind, like I've said before, y'all, I love economy. I love business. I love retail. For a long time, I had a retail problem. I finally kicked it. But for a minute there in the past, I had a retail problem. I did. I love it. Okay. I want to see it succeed. I complain so vocally because I see it failing and I see how it could be better. But anyway, here's my vision for all stores, all retailers. My vision is for your offerings to be so good that I literally either have to avoid your store or have tunnel vision when I walk in because I know I will buy everything. I know I will. I know I will. Like, okay, I, I got to walk through the store, just have tunnel vision, PTE. Don't look around. Don't look around. Oh my God, why did you look to the right? give it to me. Yes. Put it in the car. Yep. Put it in there. And damn you. Damn you for all this stuff being so good 
that I spend almost my whole paycheck in here. That is the goal. That's the objective because that tells me you truly understand what I want and need. I shouldn't be able to circle your whole store and walk out empty handed because I'm so incredibly disappointed in the offerings. I want to be resist. I want to have to resist temptation when I walk in. That's the goal. Because that means you are supplying me and providing me with things that I really need and really want. That's the goal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Target is like that for some of you guys, right? I went in Target the other day. I had to look away. Tunnel vision. My, my local Target is kind of picked through though. I think they're having supply chain issues. I think everybody is. They didn't really have a lot of what I wanted. And that's the whole other thing. And I'll leave it at that. And then we'll do after show. Like, please develop some sort of advanced ordering system where I basically tell you as the grocery store, as the mall, as whoever, hey, in a few days, I'm coming to look for this item. Please make sure it's there. Hey, in a few days, I'm coming to pick up all of these things. Make sure they're in stock. Like, don't get me started, you guys. I think y'all just did. So I'm going to stop. All right. And I'm going to go through some of your comments. And then we'll get out of here. OK, for this Sunday afternoon, because it is beautiful outside. So I want to make sure we are taking advantage of that and enjoying it. Welcome, everybody. If you can't tell, I'm very passionate about this subject. It's one of my major soapboxes. I have a couple. I think I have like four major soapboxes. <laughs> I think it's like four. Um, so that's one of them, though. That's one of my majors. So let's go through some of these comments. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Right. And see, so here's my exact point. It says Amazon and McDonald's and Walmart made people use welfare and food stamps. And I think what you're referring to is that... Um, where is the one I always use? There we go. Is that... A lot of their employees were on welfare and food stamps, and these are the largest employers in the country. So basically, the way I heard it put when I heard it was, you can thank Walmart and Amazon and McDonald's for all these people being on welfare. You can thank them for that because these people are working full-time jobs, you guys, full-time and way more grueling than anything you could ever dream of. And they're still on food stamps because they qualify. Because keep in mind, you have to qualify for those things. You don't just apply and get it. You have to be making beneath a certain dollar amount to receive them. So that means that these companies are paying so little that the majority, I won't say majority because I don't know the numbers, but a good number of their employees are on some form of benefits, but they have jobs. So how much sense does that make? Like these people need to be held accountable for this. They do. Right. And yeah, let's not even mention all the abuse that the different retail workers take. Acting nuts, coughing on them. I know y'all saw that video of the boy in Walmart knocking that guy out who spit on him. Did y'all see that video? I'm not going to show it here because I want to leave this video monetized, but um, the guy started off by pushing a cart into the kid. I won't call him a kid. He could be a grown man, just young, young looking. But um, he started off by pushing the cart into this man and kind of forcing him up against like a display. I can't help but call him a kid because he looks so young. The young man breaks out of that, you know, pinned situation. One of his employee or coworkers start trying to hold him back. The guy who ran the cart into him spits on him. And then the kid breaks out of that hole that his coworker had him in, squared up, boom, one hit, and literally night, night. Night, night. It was so beautiful. I think I watched it like 10 or 12 different times. It was graceful. It was like a beautiful ballet. I wonder how many of you saw that. It was fantastic. If you want to find it, probably just go on YouTube and type in Walmart uh, employee knocks out customer or something like that. It was fantastic. It was brilliant. I wonder if he has a GoFundMe. If he does, somebody let me know what it is so I can hit him up. Let's see here. I'm just going through your comments. Thank you all for joining.
Yeah. <laughs> it says PTE, you're the kind of gal who can do anything. I appreciate your vote of confidence. I appreciate that. <laughs> Oh, I'm just always trying to figure out a solution. That's it. Always trying to figure out a solution. I'm still here. I'm just going through your comments. I wonder how or what kind of employment situation you guys are in these days. Are you guys working? Are some of you unemployed? Did you go back to school? Let's see. Just scrolling comments. Right. It says, in my, uh, they were adding someone, at Curious One, in my opinion, these uber capitalists are the ones that ruin their own economic system. Socialism is a reaction to capitalism run amok. Absolutely. Because capitalism always destroys itself. That's the whole problem with it. it. It works great for a little while, but then it ultimately destroys itself. Because think about it like this. Many businesses operate off of the premise that they should be making more profit each year, right? So if you start a business in 2021, you should make more profit in 2022, 23, 24, so forth and so on. But here's the reality of life. The reality of life is some years you will make more profit, other years you will make the same amount of profit, and other years you will make less profit, and that's okay. Who told you you're supposed to be making more money every year? Who told you that? Are you doing anything to make more money every year? This is why their salespeople are so aggressive, because they're trying to do something that's not really guaranteed. There's no guarantee that you'll make more money next year. Why should you? Have you done anything different to make more money? Have you improved your products? Have you improved your services, your customer service? Have you exposed your product to more people? Like if nothing has changed, why would you make more money? Or think about it like this. Let's say you design a product that people like and you turn, let's say, $10 million in, in clean profit every year. And for 20 years straight, you turn $10 million in profit. What's wrong with that, you guys? Like, assuming like uh, inflation and things like that, assuming nothing, inflation doesn't get so crazy to where your 10 million is like 1 million, right? Your 10 million kind of remains 10 million throughout those 20 years. What's wrong with that? What have you done wrong in that scenario? What have you done wrong in the scenario where you clear a $10 million profit every year? Your family's taken care of, your employees are taken care of, you have no debt. We'll assume you have no debt. Your customers are happy. Your products work. Your services work. What's wrong with that? Why do you then have to clear $11 million, then, cl then clear $12 million? Why? That's what destroys businesses. You're sitting here turning a clean profit every year, but that's not good enough for you. Now you want more. And then you made 11, now you want 12. You made 12, now you want 13. This is what burns people out. It's what burns your employees out. And it's what ultimately collapses your business. You just weren't satisfied. Never satisfied. Yeah, exa <laughs> exactly. It says, I bet that flower shop paid minimum wage had no benefits, drug test required, and narcissistic unhealthy behavior by the boss. You can guarantee it. And what I have come to learn over these past couple of years is that the most innocuous places of work can be some of the most nightmarish. So for example, in my more naive days, I would say, dang, how hard could working in a flower shop be? That should be like delightful, right? You're around these beautiful flowers. It has to smell good. It has to be very fresh, very tropical. So how, how nightmarish could working in a flower shop be? But what I've come to find out is a lot of people in the strangest of industries are completely psychopathic. Like for example, when I found out um, that like the yoga community has been invaded with like nuts and nut jobs, won't go down that pathway, but it was like, yeah, the yoga community is like deteriorating right now. And I was like, what? Really? Yoga? I thought yoga was supposed to be peaceful. But like 
Same example with the flower shop. Like, oh man, that sounds like it would be awesome. And I bet a lot of people apply to the flower shop thinking it would be awesome and leave out of there traumatized. Sandy looks like she's traumatized more than one person in her career. Like, how do you make something beautiful, miserable? Let's see here. Like we have got to break out of the spell. I feel like part of what my job is, is to help people break out of this spell. It's a spell that they're under. And it really takes some strong spell breaking to get them to snap out of it. It's like if you were to bring these managers into a room and offer some sort of training and say, the first thing I want you to do in this training is describe to me what it means to treat people like human beings. I guarantee you they would struggle with it. In your own words, tell me what it would mean to treat your employee like a human being. Well, before we get to the employee, in your own words, what does it mean to treat someone like a human being? I guarantee you they would look at me with a blank stare. And I would say, I'm going to give you all 15 minutes to meditate on it. Then I'm going to start calling on you. And I would just sit there. And if I had a nail file, I would just file my nails with my legs crossed at the front of the room while they meditate on what it means to treat people like human beings. I'm a fun teacher. Let's see here. <laughs> Oh my goodness. All right, let's see here. Oh, here's another format. It says permission to exist being on call is also called per diem, right? So you could kind of be on call for these companies and then they can just pay you for that particular day. So it's like, hey, are you available? You know, you'll make 60 bucks. I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? I'm not doing anything. Run in, make 60 bucks real quick and run out. Like, that's the way, that was the vision, man. Like, that was the plan. Like, I don't know what broke down. I don't know how this thing got so messed up. And now my generation are starting to move into the leadership and management positions. And what I'm seeing is they act just like the leaders and managers that we're trying to get rid of. They adopted all of their behaviors, almost all of them. I'm so disappointed. I can't even tell you how disappointed I am in my generation. I don't even want to go to my high school reunion because I am so disappointed in so many of them that are going to show up, mainly because they just simply became the very people that we were so against when we were young. And you just became just like them. All they had to do was give you a little bit of money. And that was it. And you became just like them. A little bit of money and a title. Ooh, the worst thing they ever did was give y'all titles. Oh, my God regional this, director that, supervisor of this. That's the worst thing they ever did to you guys. It ruined you. It literally ruined you. Because understand this, you might be the regional director of global head finances, security, whatever, but you are nothing to the regional director of somebody else's company. You're nobody. You might as well be an entry-level employee. Y'all have got to get over yourselves. You really have to. You used to be humble, sweet people. I don't know what happened to you. Let's see here. Because somebody gave you a title with the word director in it. And now you really think that has changed something. Let's see here. All right. Guys, I am going to go ahead and wrap it up. I appreciate you all. Yeah, and a little bit of power too. Exactly. Little money, little power. That's it. But I appreciate you all. This will not be the last time that we talk about this subject. I'm very passionate about it. Just to reiterate, my goal with all this is not to eliminate employment. It's not to eliminate business. It's not to eliminate the economy. We need all of those. And I actually really enjoy all of those things. My goal is to help create a format that does not destroy the human that does not suck people's souls out of the bottoms of their feet, that leaves people in a better state than when they started with you. And that makes it to where we can all go out here and earn our livings honestly, without even worrying about being mistreated by our boss or being mistreated by our company, 
without worrying whether or not we can put our guard down. I can't tell you how many people start jobs guarded and they have to be guarded and they have every right to be guarded because of how they've been treated in the past, because they walked in naive. They walked in sweet with their eyes and ears and everything wide open and got mollywopped and got abused and mistreated on the job, on the job. So a lot of people are traumatized by you people. Yes, even coming out of places like flower shops. It's like, how did you manage to get traumatized in a flower shop? You see what I mean? <laughs> Like how? That's like working as a lifeguard. Well, I could see how that could be traumatizing because bad things happen on the job. Lifeguard is not a good example. What's supposed to be fun? Give me something fun. What's fun, y'all? I was going to say Disney, but we already got so many stories coming out of there. That's not a good example either. Um, that's okay. Perfect. That's like working at a playground, like a really cool playground and walking away from that job traumatized somehow. That's the best example I could come up with, you guys. So we need to put it into this. Everyone has to work. Everyone needs money. Most people don't mind working. Most people like to work. Many people work more than one job voluntarily. So the issue is not people wanting to work. The issue is people like you, Miss Cindy, who are always so quick to jump to conclusions, make assumptions, make judgments, make decisions about people that impact their lives negatively. And then you wonder why nobody wants to work for you, why it's hard. Word gets out. I don't know about Prairie Village, Kansas, but it sounds like it might be kind of small. And I guarantee you, word is already out about you, Miss Cindy, okay? So with that said, thank you all for joining. I appreciate you. I'm gonna wrap the stream. This will be put on the podcast within 24 to 48 hours. So you can check it out there. And there is a link to the podcast in the description box. Take care. Enjoy your Sunday. And we will talk again soon. Bye.